Hello everyone, my name is John Sippel. I'm a staff software engineer with the Google Enterprise AI team, and it's my privilege today to present to you some of our thoughts related to anomaly detection. I'm gonna to talk to you about how we got into anomaly detection first, talk to you about our initial problem that got us started in this, in this area. And then we'll talk about some lessons learned and how we attempted to solve the problems and some of our results and where we are taking uh, with our research and implementation anomaly detection into the future. So to, to address our problem, how we got started in 2019, uh, the smart buildings team at Google approached us, the uh, AI team, to uh, work with them on a digital building solution, a smart buildings digital building solution. And what they asked us to do is come up with an AI enabled approach that allows us to detect devices that are broken and inform the technicians of a broken device, an HVAC device, a climate control device, much like a boiler, heater, those kinds of devices. And the whole point of this is if we can get our systems to operate uh, efficiently without failures and we can detect failures early, our systems will be more efficient and uh, we'll achieve uh, you know, the top level uh, climate and occupancy comfort that we want to have. So what do these devices look like? Well, there are uh, a whole range of different back-end devices that keep the, build, the climate conditions in a building nice and warm and cool in the summer. And these devices generate, uh, up in, in we've calculated 120 million measurements a day from 150,000 climate control devices from 145 Google office buildings in the California Bay Area. We developed an, a fault detection system that um, that was deployed in June 2019, and we've had pretty good results with it. It's generated hundreds of facility technician work orders and uh, achieved a 44% true positive rate. That was measured by the number of uh, work orders compared to the number of anomalies that were detected by uh, the smart building fault detection system. So it's really been adopted in the uh, facilities operations teams at Google, and we're building that out to be a, uh, a, a broader scale uh, facilities fault detection system. Um, and what we've done in the meantime is we've actually taken it out of the just doing uh, detecting failures in buildings and made a more general purpose anomaly detection solution. So before we get into how it works and kind of the overview of it, let's first do, spend a little bit of time defining anomaly detection. So you have a data point X that's generated by a device. It's an observation that may have several measurements. If it's from a device in a building, then it may have temperature, airflow rate, um, humidity levels, CO2 levels, airflow rate, set, set points, those kinds of things. And it's just a numeric vector that has a timestamp and is associated with a particular time uh, and device. Now, anomaly detection is really addressing the question of, is X actually a normal observation for this device under these conditions? So is X a member of normal? And if the probability that X is a member of normal is very, very low, then X is an anomaly. It's something that doesn't fit in. Now, that's kind of the most general purpose definition of anomaly detection. And there are certain questions that need to be answered for any implementation. The first question is, how do you define what normal is? Normal can be as simple as an average and a standard deviation, or it can be much more sophisticated based on neural networks or support vector machines. The next question you can ask is, well, how do you test normal? What kind of uh, test do you apply? If, if your version of normal is just a standard deviation and an average, then you can use a, a Gaussian approximation and come up with a probability that way. But in most cases, when you're dealing with multivariate anomaly detection, you have to apply a more sophisticated test. Now, those are the kinds of questions that are addressed in common textbooks about anomaly detection, but we found one question is very important in anomaly detection is how do you describe the anomaly? Why is that particular data point anomalous? Especially when you're dealing with very high dimensionality, many measurements inside a single observation, it's not sufficient simply to, to declare that that data point is anomalous. You need to explain why it's anomalous. In our implementation of anomaly detection, we gathered a few practical lessons I'd like to share with you today. First, novel failures have no labels. 
devices are put together into very complex systems in environments that haven't been fully uh, uh, defined. And so there are emergent failures uh, that have never been seen before. And even if you're trying to develop an anomaly detector based on known failures, by definition, anomalies are rare events and therefore you have very few labels. So novel failure modes have no labels, known, la known failures have very few labels. That's always a problem that's been vexing anomaly detection. You have the very bad class imbalance problem. Also, these complex devices integrated into complex interconnected systems generate both multivariate, many different dimensions, and multimodal time series. Take a look at the bottom right-hand corner of this picture here, and you see two different modes. You see a daytime mode and a nighttime or off-time mode. Um, the, the high peak areas, the high activity is during the daytime, and the low quiet periods where there's very little change in these time series represents the off-time. Those are two different modes that occupy different regions in feature space. And so an, a good anomaly detection solution will be sensitive to understanding what mode this device happens to be in when it's declaring something to be anomalous or normal. Also, this is very common with all anomaly detection uh, solutions that they tend to be uh, bothered by high uh, false positive rates, which can hide true anomalies. If it's very costly to investigate each anomaly, and many of them are false positives, it's very possible that the technician team will never actually get to identify a true anomaly. So these are the real important lessons that I want to share with you. It's very important in practice to provide an explanation to an anomaly detection problem. So you technicians need to be able to explain, diagnose, prioritize, and fix the problem. Secondly, something that's also not addressed in the literature on anomaly detection is that if you want to scale anomaly detection to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, you need to have a distributed architecture. I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation kind of focusing on those two practical lessons. First, um, you know, first you have the anomaly and then you want to get it to resolution. So here's a picture. You detect an anomaly and you want to resolve that anomaly. And this is kind of the picture that you get from most textbooks and most uh, theoretical implementations of anomaly detection. You have the, you have the, you detect the anomaly, you do something, and then it's resolved. Well, in practice, it's a lot more complex, and there's a user journey that the, that the technician has to actually walk the anomaly through to get to resolution. First, the anomaly has to be diagnosed, and it's diagnosed with an explanation about the anomaly. What about the features that were in this observation are so strange to declare, it, to declare it an anomaly? Well, that explanation is then merged with the technician's knowledge of the system to come to a diagnosis and an, an estimate of what the root cause of the anomaly was. Next, the technician has to understand what the severity of the anomaly is. How, how urgent is this situation? Is it going to degrade the entire system if left un, untouched? Or is this something that can be worked later uh, when other uh, problems have been resolved? Well, that goes to prioritization. Anomalies will have to be prioritized. Once the prioritization is done, those top priority anomalies will be treated. A fix will be applied. The technician will go and uh, based on the diagnosis, uh, select a treatment and implement that treatment. And we hope that in new updated results and observations of that particular device, we see that it went from an anomalous state back into the normal state. And then at that point only have you got to the resolution. So anomaly detection needs to consider this entire user journey when you're implementing it in the real world, if it's going to be of practical use to the technicians. Let's talk about interpreting anomalies a little bit. What does an interpretation or an explanation for an anomaly look like? So um, back in 2017 and in a few cases before that, but really in 2017, explainable AI really came about um, because of a need to understand some of these complex AI models and what made an AI model make a particular decision. And so these explainable AI techniques do attribution. So if you are... Um, if you have an image classifier, the explainable AI technique will highlight the pixels on the image that uh, were most influential in the classification decision. So for anomaly detection, that's no different at all. Instead of looking at the pixels, the, uh, the explainable AI technique will highlight or emphasize those features that had the greatest influence on the 
anomaly detector's decision to declare this particular data point as an anomaly. So one of the things that we th I think is quite interesting is that just until recently, 2020 in fact, really those were never really brought together, anomaly detection with, uh, with uh, explainable AI. And MADI, our implementation, multivariate anomaly detection with interpretability, was one of the very first anomaly detection algorithms designed from the ground up with explainability in mind. Our solution uh, applies a combination of negative sampling neural network to detect anomalies, combined with integrated gradients to do the variable attribution or identify those features that had the greatest uh, influence on the anomaly score. Uh, that variable attribution we often refer to as blame. What are the features that can be blamed for having made this device uh, produce an anomalous uh, observation? How do uh, these interpreted anomalies look? So on the left-hand side, I'm, sh I'm showing two representations. The left-hand side is very simple. So they have two things. Number one, the anomaly score has to be there, which is represented within the dark red circle. The score is 0.0. .0 that's the probability that it's normal, very, very low. And the, the circle around it, um, uh, if you look at it in a, in a, in a clockwise, clockwise manner, 52% uh, of that particular anomaly is blamed on the zone air temperature. And 32% is applied to the supply air flow rate. And so the two in combination, a technician will understand that there may be a stuck damper uh, that is preventing uh, the, the, the air from, is just allowing the air to enter from the outside, causing the zone air temperature to fall below. The other thing that we think is absolutely important in, in, in an anomaly interpretation is a contrastive baseline point. What's the nearest normal point against which you can compare? Here we're showing it in Kelvin, so 19 degrees versus 21 degrees Celsius, the, what was observed versus what was expected to be seen. On the right-hand side, uh, the one thing I want to point you to is kind of the timeline in the center of this chart that shows when the device was in an anomalous state. As you recall, these devices go from between modes, and sometimes they're more anomalous than others. The, the timeline representation is very useful for the technician to understand under what conditions, at what times, for example, what's the context when the device uh, enters into an anomalous state and when it uh, emerges from that anomalous state. It's very useful in, in diagnosing and, and fixing the problem. So now I wanna address the second part of our lesson, which is what do you do when you have a complex system with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices? So uh, it looks maybe like this. What we found is these, these large complex systems aren't homogeneous. They're, they're composed of many different types of devices that are integrated into a larger system. Each of these devices fulfill a particular purpose. Now, how do you apply anomaly detection to that particular problem? Well, one approach you could say, well, let's build one anomaly detection model that kind of rules them all, where all the devices whether they're of the same type or not, or put into a single model. And if you have tens of thousands of devices or hundreds of thousands of devices that produce uh, uh, multi-dimensional vectors and, and hundreds of millions, maybe billions of measurements a day, that can easily overwhelm a single process. Um, the other extreme is you could create an anomaly detection process to run on each device independently. Well, we suggest the appropriate choice, the most practical choice is something in between, where what you do is you segment the population into homogeneous, uh, into homogeneous cohorts, where uh, the members are all kind of similar. They have the same fixed properties, they're the same type of device. For example, in the smart buildings world, there are VAVs in one cohort, boilers in another cohort. If it's data, uh, data networking systems, then it's maybe the routers and the switches of a particular type in a single cohort. Well, one thing we also learned when you're dealing with large complex systems is that the population is consistently changing and the membership is changing. New devices are being added, old devices are being removed, and you need your architecture to be dynamic and responsive to that. So therefore, we suggest you resegment your population periodically to always make sure that the membership of the devices in the cohorts, the devices in the cohorts are up to date. Now a controller then will go ahead and launch independent 
anomaly detection instances or processes for each cohort. Each, co each instance is responsible for just its cohort. And the controller will inform the instances when the membership changes. So the, con so the instances are always looking at a fresh view of what devices are in their cohort. Now, these instances are responsible for doing two things automatically. First, they're responsible for maintaining a fresh anomaly detection model based on the latest data. So that means they periodically retrain and all of that happens automatically without human interaction. So they replace old models with new models and refresh the models. The second thing an anomaly detection instance is re required to do is to observe the incoming data stream and use the model to classify the observations as normal or not normal. Then, the controller will aggregate the results from all the instances and rank order the anomalous, the most anomalous members by their severity and aggregate by blame. The, the third part here, aggregate by blame, is particularly interesting when you have uh, potentials for systematic failures. For example, assume a bad firmware update is deployed and disables a large number of the devices in the network they may exhibit the same sort of blame or the same sort of explanation, the same symptoms. And what we want to do and what we've done um, uh, is aggregate by, by blame, by the attributions, and come up with a kind of a sim symptomatic description of what this large-scale systematic anomaly looks like. And then we produce that rank ordered list and the end user, the technician at the end of this process sees the most anomalous devices, especially those that are uh, systematic across many devices, and provides the explanation that the technician can use to, to, to complete the, the resolution and uh, journey. So that has been put together and we've open sourced uh, MADI, our, as I say, our, our library. So in June 2019, we deployed uh, the first version in the smart buildings. Then uh, we took some time to um, generalize it and take it out of just the smart buildings, but make it more of a general purpose library. And we presented it at the International Conference of Machine Learning last year. Um, and then we open sourced the MADI library so that the greater community can use uh, anomaly detection with interpretability. And in August 20, we set forth and created a proof of concept uh, where we adapted the, the interpretable anomaly detection for data centers. And that uh, proof of concept was successful. And now we're in the productionization phase of MADI for data centers with Xenos. So I wanted to just briefly end with a discussion of where we see anomaly detection going in the future. And um, We've, the idea here is we combine the best of breed language models with negative sampling anomaly detections. So these language models were originally developed for language translation. So the model learned to translate from say German to English. Um, the same type of technology can be used to learn the language, the log line language, syslog line language of individual processes on, that are running on a computer. So you imagine that this language model learns what's normal and with the help of the negative sampling anomaly detector is able then to recognize uh, based on the, the, the text what's normal and what's not normal. Um, and then at the right hand side here in this little diagram, we're showing an example of where a systematic error is being shown where uh, we have a cluster of devices of hosts, uh, 70 hosts in this particular case, that are all affected by some sort of anomaly related to the kernel process. This information helps the uh, computer technician narrow down from se several orders of magnitude of detail down to focusing on specific hosts uh, and specific log lines from a specific process. So we think that this has a lot of um, uh, a lot of promise and we've developed it and are running that in-house and have already yielded some very, very good results on that in, 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 in uh, virtual machines and monitoring virtual machines. So uh, thank you very much for your, uh, your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Chanchal now who will actually talk about how this concept of MADI was productionized 
for Xenos. Thank you.